welcome back to 75 Reads. I am Joe Bozarth. And I am April Bowlby. And today we are starting The Outsider by Colin Wilson. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I was telling April earlier that uh, when I first opened this book, I felt like, wow, I just, I really don't get it. And then I got it. And then I got it too much. Like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like I feel very all over the place because I have so many thoughts. Uh-huh. And you know, with our other books, they were stories. Yeah, we could go in, you know, sequence. I feel like this is kind of all over the place. It's all over the place because it's not a narrative, guys. It's a study. It's a study. It's it is like a college textbook. <laughs> it is. So, which brings me to okay. So, Colin Wilson, when he wrote this book was 24 Mm. and maybe I'm a jerk, but I'm like, okay, at first I felt like I was an idiot. And then I was like, why don't I get the point of this? And then I got it. And then I saw not only Bowie in this book, but I saw how it could be applied to different types of artists. Because for me, the outsider is an artist. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll get into it. But, you know, and then later on, he, he talks mostly about writers and then around chapter four, he brings in a dancer and he brings uh, in a painter who we will will discuss. And you guys will know. You'll be like, aha. But um, <laughs> but, the, but did you at some point think, what made this 24-year-old qualified to write this book? Yes. What experience? I mean, I guess his experience that he was going through. Right. He can Life be labeled experience? as an outsider. Is he an outsider? Is he an outsider? But he's 24. Uh, but I guess age doesn't matter with yeah. outsiders. It's just kind of like a consciousness. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which throughout the book, there are many definitions uh, of what qualifies an outsider to mm-hmm. be an outsider. So that's um, that's exciting. That's like catnip from my brain. I get very excited when there's a, a very clear definition that's been given to me. <laughs> um, because it's, it's uh, kind of all over the place. And I feel the first, you know, 15 pages, I thought I had the wrong book because it was so intense yeah. and there was no story. But yeah. I digress. We will share the story that we found in The Outsider. Yeah. I mean, basically, we're talking existentialism, alienation, and in the forward, uh, it says existentialism, alienation, and the crisis of modern car- consciousness, which kind of reminded me of, and, I, and we mentioned it um, on our 1984 episode, uh, Bowie's interview with Burroughs. I feel like that's pretty much what they talked about. So it's it's relevant, guys. It's relevant. <laughs> so, so shall we? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that kind of struck me towards the beginning of the book. Let's see. It was on page 17, like really the beginning of the book. Oh, I have that as well. Do you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay it was Okay, so good. That means we're like picking up the same, same page. page. Yes. Well, I wonder if we did. I wonder. So the outsider may be an artist, but the artist is not necessarily an outsider. Yes. I was like, oh, that's very Bowie. What can be said to characterize the outsider is a sense of strangeness, of unreality. Even Keats could write... In a letter to Brown, just before he died, I feel as if I had died already and am now living a posthumous existence. This is a sense of unreality that can strike out a perfectly cle- out of a perfectly clear sky. Good health and strong nerves can make it unlikely, but that may be only because the man in good health is thinking about other things and doesn't look in the direction where the uncertainty lies. And once a man has seen it, the world can never afterward be quite the same straightforward place. Indeed. I disagree. Oh, ooh, Joe, tell me. Okay. Um, I think that the person with strong nerves can glimpse the unreality, can even go to the unreality for a time. Mm-hmm. But the person with really strong nerves... The healthy person can come back. I agree. I do agree. He can turn around. I think you're right. Yeah. That just popped into my head. It's so interesting. All of the outsiders in the first half of this book have been men. Yeah. Which he does mention later that women are less likely to be outsiders because they're stronger. Ooh. So. Burn. Yeah. Yeah. So take that. (laughs) Okay. Wow. Yeah. That is 
Intra- wow, he just, I just, he rose two stars in my book. That's, right? That's interesting. Right? Um, oh, yeah. Okay. I disagree. I do feel like you can come back. And is that part of the process of this book is that he goes through different levels mm-hmm. of outsiders and mm-hmm. each one he finds their fault in which they they failed and couldn't live in this life, mm-hmm. in this reality without going insane, right. essentially. Um, and he makes a study out of what not to do. <laughs> right, right. What not to do. And it seems that to him, an outsider has to be someone who is in ill health, either physically or mentally. Right. <sighs> One or the other. Usually, sometimes both. Mostly mentally. Yeah. But, you know, he has, he did cite some writers who, oh yeah, he wrote this. He got it. He was very sick at the time. He's very sick. You know, exactly. so. And then they all go insane. And they all go insane. So here's a few little yummies mm-hmm. uh, that simplified it. In the beginning, Mm -hmm. for the outsider, the world is not rational. Truth must be told. Mm -hmm. Outsider is a man who has wakened to chaos. And in spite of this truth, truth must be told. Chaos must be faced. So are they dragon slayers? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that was a big thing for them, right? The truth. Right. Finding the truth. You know, living in the truth, a lot of that was, it was a big thing. And then must thought negate life. That's the big existential problem. So is it thought that's bad? Is it life that's bad? And different outsiders had different views on it. Right. So he was talking about like, this is just crazy. So he was talking about Wells um, and he was a sick, tired man when he wrote, my, and, and you guys, he talked about so many different writers. It's hard to kind of mm-hmm. pick all of them. And you guys just need to read it because every writer you've heard of and some that you didn't think were existentialists show up in here. And I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't think Hemingway, I didn't realize he was an existentialist, right. but according to Collins, he is. But, and maybe you guys are out there like, yeah, of course he was, you idiot. But I, I just, it didn't. It wasn't part of our education. Yeah. Like, so, yeah, so he talks about Wells quite a bit. Um, he wrote, The mind or mind at the end of its tether. Uh, may we not accept this as a whole cause and moving force behind the pamphlet. So he writes this thing. He, he declares his conclusions to be objective. If he was sick when he wrote this stuff, wearing, he says, wearing his dressing gown and slippers. Um, is it our mm-hmm. business to judge whether the world can be seen in such a way that Wells's conclusions are inevitable? If so, to decide whether such a way of looking at things is truer, more valid, more objective than our usual way of seeing. So who's the outsider? Like, I'm super confused. And then <laughs> does the outsider become an outsider because he's sick? Or does being an outsider make one sick? That was my point. I'm like, wait, right. what was my point of all this? What begets what? Are you right. sick because you're an outsider or do you become sick because you're an outsider? Like, uh, I don't knows. know. It's mind boggling. It is mind boggling. It's like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Right? Yeah. <sighs> um, I <it> was, um, <laughs> we're, we're, um, kind of looking over our notes because there were so, so many. many important, thick, it's a dense book. I mean, only like this is even still in chapter one. There's a question: Can one can one live an existentialist philosophy without negating either life or the existentialist philosophy? And so he starts talking about Kierkegaard, who says no, but one can live a religion without negating life or religion. And even though Kierkegaard affirmed Christian values, he said that the Christian church had solved the problem of living its religion by cutting off its arms and legs to make it fit life. Then he brings Mm. in Nietzsche, who attacks the church by saying that the church solved the problem by chopping down life to fit the Christian religion. And then later we read that existentialists must see and touch their solutions, not merely accept it. So in my mind, religion's out. So I'm like, so where do they stand on religion? Right. I think it... Different for each one, right? Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's the point of the book, you guys. I don't think there's one type of, obviously, not one type of outsider. Mm-hmm. 
So I, the book to me is a study of all these different types of outsiders, of and which there are plenty. There are so many. Um, but pause because I want I want to know about the outsider. But wasn't there like a Bowie quote? He he like said three things are true, and then one of the last things it was like there is a God or yeah. something like that. Yeah, and that. I was like, oh, he he knows something. He's glimpsing something. Yeah, he's glimpsing. But then, like, it does fit. There's a religion. There's a not a religion. However, it works for everyone. Well, exactly. And I think the outsider is trying to figure it all out. Yeah. And I do, and I don't know if you caught this, but Wilson also kind of slams all these guys because he's like, they kind of give up. Right. Yes. They give up. They either get lazy. They get distracted. They go crazy. They they go crazy. They (laughs) give up on the search. Right. And so they don't really even finish it. Or they want to sell books, which he kind of points at um, Hemingway. Uh, I I think sort of unfairly, but my opinion. Well, there's there is my favorite chapter was um, the romantic outsider, Mm. which is like the guy who (laughs) um, is idealistic, pale, and a poet. But manly. <laughs> so did that make you think of Bowie in a way? Yes. I know. Me too. I was like, oh, Bowie's the romantic outsider. And look, we didn't get through the whole book. Obviously, we're doing part of it. Mm-hmm. He might be a few different kinds of outsiders. Well, like, okay, so what stuff made you think of Bowie? So that definitely made me think of right. Bowie. Totally. Like, I'm like, oh, well, that describes him. Dreamer of other worlds. Mm-hmm. I was like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Check. So this made me think of, of art. Um, kind of towards the beginning, he's, uh, let's see, he talks about, I don't know if I'm saying the name right, Roquentin, his tale about when he's at a pub and he gets about of nausea and then somebody puts on a record and it's women singing some of these days, such a good song. And the nausea disappears as Mm. he's listening to this record Mm -hmm. and Um, let's see, like Wells, Quentin insists on the objective of nature of the revelation. Somebody puts on a record. It's the voice of a Negro woman singing some of these days. The nausea, nausea disappears as he listens. When the voice is heard in the silence, I felt my body harden and the nausea vanish. Suddenly it was almost unbearable to become so hard, so brilliant. I am in the music. Globes of fire turn in the mirrors and circled by a ring of smoke. And it says there's no need to analyze this experience. It's the old familiar aesthetic experience, art giving order and logic to chaos. Bowie. 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 Doesn't that sound right? Just reading that makes me happy. I know. <laughs> I mean, so, oh, and then he says only something as instinctively rhythmic as the blues can give him a sense of order that doesn't seem false. Ah. Oh. Don't you, and then when I read that, I feel like I'm an outsider for sure. Yeah, don't you? <laughs> yes. Like, yes, I get it. I get yeah. it. And then, and then, Roquentin also, um, it goes on to say that he feels insignificant before things without the meaning his will would normally impose on it. His existence is absurd. And there's like 1984. Right. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh my God. Oh, Isn't it that is all crazy? connected. How yeah. interesting is that? Yeah. Ew. So there are so many connections to this. And then I'm thinking, oh, well then Orwell was an outsider. You know, like the Right. And his characters were outsiders, clearly. Yeah. So And that's what the book book yeah. walks us through too, is it will take an author and then give us excerpts of the characters and show why the characters are outsiders. Are outsiders. And, even how the author is the outsider, writing the outsider. It's very puppetry. There's a lot, it a is. lot of strings, a lot of knitting through ideas in this book. Yes. Um, yes. Let's see. Oh, here's the part where I, that I referenced. Okay. Um, they're talking about, of course, more, more writers. And it's in a, I think they're talking about a play at this point. And it is to be noted that this is one of the characters that Catherine Barkley was in love with Henry long before he realized he was in love with her. The woman is always more instinctively well-adjusted, less susceptible to the abstract than the man. Hey. <laughs> hey now. Hey. Oh, yeah. I think so. 
That makes my I mean, so posture straight. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Strong, grounded. We've yeah. got this. But also I think women are more in tune with intuition and senses so that are just naturally in us. And so maybe as a male outsider, it's like a it's almost overwhelming and it's something mm-hmm. that we deal with every day maybe so it doesn't overwhelm us I think we deal with it every day also I feel that we're allowed to in a way that society doesn't allow men to and mm. so here comes a guy like Bowie right and he dresses and acts and speaks however he feels on any given day yeah if a woman did a lot of the stuff that he did mm. It might not have been so controversial. Right. But he's a man and men. And look, again, I will say I I consider myself a feminist. I'm saying this because I really do believe that um, men are expected to be a certain way in our society. Mm. Um, And I, I see it more so now that I have a little, a baby boy. I don't, I am very careful not to have like, you know, I want everything to be very gender neutral in our house. Right. Um, his toys, his clothes, whatever, um, because I want him to feel that he can be sensitive and he can glimpse, you know, whichever which way he wants to glimpse and, right. and express himself in whichever which way, whichever way. Yeah, mm. You guys know what I'm saying. I need more coffee. <laughs> um, and I feel Bowie did that. Bowie felt he could do it. He did it. And it's controversial more so for a man than it is for a woman. Yes, I agree. So, well, that's yeah. what a gift you're giving because I think the the part of an outsider is to see this world mm-hmm. and almost break through the rules of mm-hmm. it. Like, why is everyone doing what they're doing? You ask yeah. the question constantly, like, what? what is my purpose and is my purpose in this world or is it a different world who sets the rules for truth exactly well and that's a big theme of this right so outsiders are searching for their purpose Mm -hmm. did you okay so to me and i jotted this down let me see if i can find it because (laughs) it kind of made me laugh and it probably isn't supposed to be funny but Uh-oh. I thought you found humor in existentialism. I did. This is great. So it seems to me um, that outsiders never quite get there. Ah. They, they never quite figure themselves out. And right. if they do, they're there for a few seconds because they die. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Right? They die. Like there's like... There are stories in here yeah. that now I'm, there are like five books that I want to read because we're reading this book. Yes. Um, that, you know, he figured it out and then he drowned, you know, <laughs> like, oh, oh, oh snap. Snap. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, they, they all seem to reach a terrible end. Um yeah, they yeah, do. They, it's awful. It's very strange. The the and I want to I want to go back to where but I just have this dog-eared right here. It's um outsiders. This is what I is scary about outsiders, but I kind of like like it. It says that you cannot escape chaos by refusing to look at it mm-hmm. and real order must be preceded by a descent into chaos, which I feel like if you were saintly Maybe that rule wouldn't apply, but since we're only human, you might have to go into the muck to come through. And I think our world is very much about avoiding the muck. Like, don't look over there. Yes. Don't talk about it. As and he calls the bourgeois. Yes, the bourgeois. They avoid the muck. Exactly. They have no muck. They have well, no muck. Well, and it's like we were talking about, um, I, I feel like you and I were poloing about this the other day, uh, about how, as an artist, too... You have to, you live in the light, but you have to dive into the, go into the dark. Yes. And that comes up again. I think it's a very similar thing. It's a theme. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And how deep do you go Mm -hmm. and can you get out of it? Can you get out of it? I think some people can and some people can't. I think so too. And I think you can be an out, you could be a part time outsider. (laughs) (laughs) Just dip your foot occasionally. Yeah. I mean, I do think that the outsider, doesn't have to totally get lost, get sucked in, and either die or go mad. Mm-hmm. I agree. I think that's an old look. This is this is since the beginning. Mm-hmm. I mean, we talk about Nietzsche. We talk about 
um, Hemingway. Majinsky, Hemingway. Like this is, we like, talk about Van Gogh. We talk about Van Gogh. Oh my God, the stuff. I love when he brings in finally a painter and mm. a dancer. Ah, oh, me too. Me too. Uh, because it's, it is, it's like, it's all of the different arts. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So that's about, before we get to that, mm -hmm. did you catch the part where um, the outsiders are talking about, I'm trying to remember which ones, about not being better than our fathers? Um, let's see. Mm. Uh, is it a play? Is it? Yes. Oh. Um, near religious terminology. Uh, yes, it is a play. Stroud and Oliver. Stroud, get me the Bible, will you? I want to verify. I think it's First Kings 19. Oliver, what's the quotation? Stroud. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Very modern and progressive and disillusioned of Elijah. Why ever should he expect to be? And I feel like that is true for outsiders and not outsiders. Because I feel like, so the outsider, another th characteristic of an outsider is an appetite for progress. Mm. Um, but, but we don't get better than our fathers. And it's to say we're not wiser than them. We're not less futile. We're still a slave to the weaknesses that they were slaves to. We still need the same things that they needed. We haven't gone that much further than our fathers, than their fathers, than their fathers. Right. Like since the beginning of time, we haven't changed all that much. We haven't figured it out. No. The outsiders tried to figure it out. Hasn't figured it out. They, they get a little beat up doing it too. Yeah. 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 So I just thought that was really interesting. Not better than our fathers. That is right. We so. have a very slow trajectory. Like yeah. Like real slow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And did it also kind of make you think of meditation? Like, so Hemingway's early work up to his short story, um, about a major whose wife died is a long meditation on human vulnerability and meditation on human vulnerability always leads to religious thinking. It all kind of comes back to rent around mm -hmm. to Hemingway's. He must find things he cannot lose to develop to the development of an ethnic ethic, sorry, ethic of renunciation and discipline. If it leads to a realization that man is not a constant unchanging being, he is one person one day, another person the next. So he's saying, the outsider changes. Right. Man changes. And I do feel like in order to get to certain states, you have to, there's that whole argument. It goes back to what's the, what's the monster here? Is it thought? What's uh -huh. the bad guy? Is thought the bad guy or is reality the bad guy? Right. Is life bad or is thought bad? Like it all ties back in. Yeah. These, it's a, such a battle to consciously mm -hmm. battle every day. Like to be conscious of that every day, every step you take, that is exhausting. Yeah. They're just talking about how can they be less of a slave to their circumstances. And I mean, look, he brings in Camus, he brings in T.S. Eliot, mm -hmm. Aldous Huxley. You guys, we can't even cover all mm -mm, of it. There's mm -mm. just no way. You 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 got to read it. Yeah, <laughs> you've got to read it. So the chapter on the romantic outsider, I know you. That's this chapter really spoke to you, right? Yeah. Um, this made me also think of. Let's see. Um, talking about the romantic outsider. Uh, let's see, the type of, of the high idealistic young poet, pale but manly, like you said, in the previous century, the pining lover had been a comic figure. Will, when, lurk, when looking well, can't move her, looking ill prevail. Oh. Looking well can't move her, will looking ill prevail? Do I, yeah. Do I have to look ill I've to get the girl? I've dated so many romantic <laughs> outsiders. <laughs> Unbelievable. I'm like, oh, you you look a little... I mean... Oh, let me get you over here. <laughs> that made me think of... Is that today's hipster? Oh, interesting. Is that Bowie in Germany when he was hanging out with... Um, when he was hanging out with... Um, oh, my gosh. Why am I blanking on his name? Lust for Life. Lust for Life? Lust for Life. Oh, my God. Know. I love Iggy Pop. Hello. Oh. God, I had a blank there for a second. Bowie and Iggy Pop hanging out in Germany, living on cocaine and milk. Like, yeah. to me, Super that's hot. the romantic outsider. <laughs> so hot. I'm like, yes. I will take care Ill of you. Works great for <laughs> exactly. me. 
Yes, you have figured it out. That's what gets the girl. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> At least these girls. Deep thoughts and uh, malnourishment. Yeah. Hey, get on over here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, also very talented. Like, cause, yes. you know, deep thinkers yeah. are, it is an interesting rabbit hole to go down. And it's unusual. Yeah. And with that, I mean, a lot of deep thinkers are in the sun chopping wood. Yeah. They're kind of inside. They are. Um, and they have beards and they're manly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right yeah, manly men but <sighs> but you know what yeah you don't look at a manly man and say hey that's a deep thinker no you I know. you look at this kind of emaciated guy who's got the furrowed brow yeah. and looks a little upset his spine is curved a little yeah, bit you're, you're like, like oh hey. he's got some deep thoughts what are you doing over there <laughs> hunched over your books yeah what are you reading come talk to me <laughs> 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 so clearly we have a soft spot for romantic outsiders. Yeah, I think we um, do. Boy, oh, oh boy. So in, in chapter three about the romantic outsider, Avi wanted me to ask you, because uh, I told I started laughing when I was reading the book. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> there's this passage from a, I believe it's either a book or a play. I don't even remember now. Oh, yes. Okay. Um the stout student who stood below them on the steps farted briefly. Dixon turns towards him, saying in a soft voice, did an angel speak? <laughs> and I start cracking up because, you know, I love flatulence. And I'm like, oh, I can't wait till we get to Confederacy of Dunces. And I was like, oh, I wonder if April thought this was funny because she hates Confederacy. Yeah. And I wonder if she also hates flash- flatulence. I, I don't like to talk about it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and I do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I don't like, I, 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 I get it, but I don't like, I like my brain understands like, oh, that's funny. Yeah. But my heart is like, absolutely not. Yeah. Like, don't talk about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> look at you laughing, <laughs> like slightly uncomfortable. Oh my gosh. Um, pretend it never happened. Uh, <laughs> just... I mean, we'll get to it when we get to a Confederacy of Dunces, but Avi was laughing. He's uh-uh. like, oh, you have to ask April if she, no. if she even like noticed that bit because. I, I was sitting there cracking up. I'm like, I did an angel speak. That's, that's hilarious. Great. No, I didn't laugh once throughout this entire book. <laughs> and I think something is clearly wrong I, with I, me. I, I didn't know. Or are you the outsider? Yeah. And I'm just stuck in reality. No, or maybe you're the outsider, and I'm. I don't get it because I'm laughing at it. <laughs> I do love flatulence. It's the simple flatulence. things. It's a body. It's a. I like You're... bodily functions. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> Avi was who won that bet because I rushed Avi thought you that would section. not think it was I did funny. It. I did it. I was like, uh. I'm like, I'll have to ask her because I'm sitting there busting up, and I had to read it to him. He's like, "Why are you laughing?" I'm like, "Who's that? It's great. That's amazing." And then on the next page, one of the most like sad, beautiful things. Um, another character we're talking about. Um, Shelley's Alistair is a young man who pines away and dies because he can find no earthly counterpart of the beautiful girl who had embraced him once in a dream. Ah, <sighs> wow! Romantic outsider, romantic right outsider. there. Hello. Mm. But then I feel like, in that sense, the romantic outsiders are so. Nutty. Yeah. Well, also like <laughs> stuck. Yeah. Do you know? Like they almost attach so yeah. unhealthily that they they can't get. They're not in the present moment. Yes. You know, like they're he's pining and he'll die for an idea of something. Yes. Yes. Which yes. is, um, you know. Well, okay. So they they're talking about the romantic outsider and the realist, and the difference is is considerable. So the realist asks truth. What do they mean by it? The romantic wouldn't dream of asking such a question. His cry is, where can I find the truth? Mm. He has no doubt whatever that, in the words of another poet who began as a romantic outsider, what the world's million lips are searching for must be substantial somewhere. So one is searching for the truth. The other one is like, it's there, but where? Like, is there truth? Where is the truth? Like, they do just have different uh, ways of approaching ways of looking it. at the world. But they're still asking the same questions. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, one thing about the romantic, I this is written, this is written on page 77. Being a romantic, Hess refuses to accept any such half measure. He has a deep sense of injustice of human beings having to live on such lukewarm level of everyday <laughs> triviality. 
He feels that there should be a way of living with the intensity of the artist's creative ecstasy all the time, which is why they went crazy. <laughs> yeah, you can't live there, you guys. You can't live there. You can visit there. Visit. Visit. Beautiful. Nice place Come to back. visit. Wouldn't want to live there. No. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, this, this is also very like, I mean, it reminds me of David Lynch. It reminds me of Bowie. They become acutely, acutely conscious of it when it begins to pain them, but they are not sure of the source of the pain. The ordinary world loses its value as it does for a man who has been ill for a very long time. Life takes on a quality of a nightmare or a cinema sheet with the screen when the screen goes blank. These men who had been projecting their hopes and desires into what was passing on the screen suddenly realize they are in a cinema. Now that would make me go crazy. Yeah. If that's how I thought. Yeah. Oof. Intense. Yeah. I got res- <sighs> I got mad respect though. Like, yeah. Look. He, he, at the end, like, I guess it's like still in talking about the romantic outsider. He talks about Siddhartha. He talks about how the Buddha failed him. Then he, then he came back to the, to Buddha. It, it was interesting working Buddhism into this mm. because I could really see that. Yeah. I really can see how, how a lot of outsiders, uh, could be attracted to Buddhism. Um, he talks about Steppenwolf, mm. um, such good stuff that I wish we could get into, but then we would be here for hours. Hours. Um, there's just so much. Um, Narzis and Goldman, another story that's beautiful that he talks about. I mean, there's just, ugh, there's so it, it, much. Oh, it's a, it's, yeah, next, definitely. when he, he finally realizes, okay, so next, realizes watching the boy that his people has revealed himself new and alien and completely his peer. This is what Castalia knew nothing of. This is what his own life had lacked. When his pupil dives into the lake, Necht follows him, fired like Ibsen's uh, master builder. By youth and life, the cold and the effort overcome him, and he drowns. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. It's terrible, but I'm like, I don't know why it makes me laugh. Because it's unnecessary. Uh, Yes, that's, you know what? Yeah. That's huge. I think that's it. Like, we can see that it's unnecessary. Yeah. You can be an outsider. You can be in search of the truth. You don't have to die no. trying. That's right. That's right. And I feel like maybe Bowie, that's why this book is on his reading list, because I. it's almost like a... Um, a cautionary tale of like it what is. makes an outsider sick. And I feel like Bowie was like so intelligent that he's like, you I got, got this. And you know, do you remember when we went to, and I think we've referenced it before, but we went to that beautiful exhibit up at um, Forest Lawn and there were, you know, there was a lot of photography and also um, a lot of uh, recorded interviews um, video interviews mm-hmm. of Bowie. And he was talking about living in the sun and how he's early to rise because he works during the day. He creates in the light. Yes. Ah, I just got goosebumps. No, it's because he's an outsider who Who gets it. Yes. He's not going to die for For it. But we wanted to live. Ah. (laughs) And there it is, you guys. There it is. But we wanted to live. But we wanted to live. (gasps) But we was life. He was life. He was a successful outsider. Yeah. And look, we're only halfway through the book. Maybe this guy, maybe Colin, he gets it talks about, through. yeah. Like maybe the rest of the way he's going to figure it out. That's right. Let's hope so. I hope so too. Because I don't want, like every other book, I don't want to be frustrated by the second half. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so that said, you guys, tune in next time to find out if the second half gets it. Or, wah, wah. <laughs> uh, yeah, the journey, come with us on the journey. The journey continues it at 75 ours. Reads. Tweet us your thoughts at 75 Reads. Um, remember our contest, hashtag WIR75. Show us where you are reading The Outsider, and we will pick our favorite photo yes. and send you one of our future reads. 
Um, and visit us at www.75reads.com. That's where we live. That's where we live, you guys. Come on over. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.